we've talked about the advantages of this, the problems of the excessive <laughs> use of the be pair, the be perfect, is they lose contact with their real self and also the people they or could can do the people they are in relationships with. So in other words, the be perfect client, yep, yeah, like you just talked about, and that's the things out with us. I I can often feel with those people that I don't really know them. Yes. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 61. We're flying through these, Bob, I can't believe it. And the topic of tonight is going to be working with the perfect client, which is all about our driver behaviours. We've got five. (laughs) So me and Bob are going to be talking about our drivers over the next five episodes. Yeah, five episodes. I was just thinking, number. did you say number 61? 61. Gosh, that's that's, uh, getting on. My age is 71, so... Ten more yeah. get to my age. Right. Ten weeks and we'll be hitting your age. <laughs> Which is interesting, don't you think? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, as, as you zoom on, as we zoom on to uh, over 100, uh, we'll see how old I am then. Well, but, uh, <laughs> but the theory you picked is interesting, which is five drivers. And uh, the driver theory that you're talking about comes from transaction analysis. He does. Which you and I trained in, and uh, Eric Burns' theory around uh, what he called drivers, and um, driver theory really is mainly about um, what we do in uh, response to our parental uh, commands from our history to get recognition. Yeah. So, th- so what we're going to talk about here is be perfect. But as you quite correct, there's five drivers uh, um, Burn talks about, being perfect, trying hard, hurrying up, being strong and please other people. So they're all defense systems and they're all ways that child learns how to get strokes or recognition from the parents because they don't want to, um, you know, go into the don't behaviors, which uh, sorry, the don't injunctions, which, which we can talk about later. Yeah. Um, but we're going to start with be perfect driver, and from very early age, we start to learn that being perfect pleases our parents, which is an interesting one. And so then we can recognition, and then we carry out those these drivers, if you like, um, throughout the rest of our life. Um, and be perfect is one which is often linked with the obsessive compulsive uh, traits that people have or the obsessive compulsive character. Um, so over to you, because you sent me some a couple of pe- couple of pages on this, which must come from TA today, I think, uh, which I hastily have, didn't have time to read because uh, our son-in-law arrived, but let's start off. So how do you see driver behaviour then, Jackie? I love driver behaviour. I use it a lot in the therapy room, and I think clients quite like it. It, it, it's We've got access to all five of them, but I find that people usually have a couple of default ones that they use more often than the others. But for me, we, we kind of... it's connected with scripty stuff as well as personality types but it's when we're stressed or overwhelmed or tired or there's something going on for me I think we tend to revert back into that old patterns of behavior exactly like you said that we got recognition and strokes for when we were growing up that's right so if we're doing be perfect I link it into many different personalities but specifically obsessive compulsive yeah. characters who have an internalized parent uh, which they experience is always judging them usually negatively yeah and being perfect will quieten the parent if you like yeah which resonates with me because I my part of my personality is obsessive compulsive type not that it's a disorder or it's diagnosed or anything 
but I do like things to be just so. So my be perfect driver pops up quite a lot. In fact, before every podcast, I've got my notebook out. I've got everything down here. I've got the the books that you were referring to earlier on. You can <laughs> see this if you're watching on the YouTube channel. Mm. I like to be organised for things, which, you know, that's my Be Perfect driver coming out. So for me, I know when I was younger, I did get a lot of recognition for maybe not being perfect, but doing a good job. Mm. Oh, and okay. when I work with parents, I talk an awful lot about praise for being as well as praise for doing. I think I got a lot of praise for doing good stuff, oh. you know, for achieving at school <clears throat> and being the best that I possibly could rather than just being me. Oh, oh. So being perfect is... Um, Impossible. Drives you, uh, drives your behaviours a lot. Yes, yeah, yeah. Being organised and being good enough and all those sort of things. Mm. See, of course, there's positive parts in that, and of course, the big, the biggest positive part actually is that you're pleasing the parent. Yes. So the parent doesn't negatively um, criticise you. Yeah. Basically, at a psychological level, and it's for, and of course, it's got you where you are today in many ways. It has, yeah. And I, 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 I quite like it. I, you know, I don't think I'd change it. When you say for pleasing the parents, I think it's, it's, you know, interesting or important maybe to remember that we're talking about our internal parents. Often oh, yeah. as adults, yeah. it's not our actual parent that we're trying to please. It's the internal dialogue that we have going on a lot of the time. Well, yes. So I'll say a little bit more about that what I think. Uh, yes, psychologically, that's that's correct, and I'm glad you said that because many of the clients that come in the room, of course, the parents have died or are not there or absent or whichever way to look at it. But of course, many parents are still alive. Yeah. So, yes, we're pleasing our internal parents. You're correct, and also, um, it's maybe enacted out with the real parents. Yes. Yeah. It is with mine all the time. I can give you lots of things, but my mum has been quite judgmental or critical on me because I've not come up to to standard or her standards, maybe. Yeah. Mm. So the positive parts are that it gets us by in the world and gives us the strokes, like we just said. And also, in your case and many other people's cases, positive parts that they are quite comfortable with because it's meant they're successful in life. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, but and and often, um, though I think that way clinically, I think more about how the be perfect may inhibit, you know, be perfect driver behavior yeah. may inhibit the actual sense of being with the client, and so that under stress, being perfect becomes the major goal, and in that they may lose contact with other people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the therapy room, it does play out quite a lot with the client as well. Not wanting to get it wrong and, you know, doing therapy right. Is there a right way to oh, do therapy yeah. and things like yeah. that that come up in the therapy room? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And the problem is, yes, let's start again. That gets enacted out in the therapy room. Yeah. Uh, it's also played out in real life in relationships. Yeah. and uh, friendships, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the, we've talked about the advantages of this, the problems of the excessive use of the be parent, the be perfect, is they lose contact with their real self and also the people they, or could can do, the people they are in relationships with. So in other words, the be perfect client, yep, yeah, like you just talked about, and that's the things out with us, I... I can often feel with those people that I don't really know them. Yeah. Because their energy is being perfect and projecting onto me this internal parental figure from yesterday. So I actually don't see them. Yeah. I see this be perfect driver instead. Yeah. So the therapy in that case would be around uh, looking at the defense, defense system of the be perfect driver, what's underneath it, 
and then the therapy will be there what's underneath the actual being perfect driver so that the person uh real self comes out warts and all yeah which if and when that does happen in the therapy room you know for for me and you know, i I've, I've witnessed it a lot of the time is there's an awful lot of shame when that defense does come down that they've been authentically them and it's just not good enough a lot of the time in their well, eyes well for the internalized parent yeah yes you're correct it is in their eyes because psychologically um you know they they need to please or get the strokes of these internalized parents so yes shame often comes with it yeah however linked to drivers and we'll talk a lot about this in, in, in the next couple of podcasts with the five drivers is burns ideas of injunctions yeah can't really talk about drivers well you can by yourself but we need to link them with injunctions because they sort of go together definitely um, yeah uh, injunctions are an easy way to think of injunctions are the what i would call the no messages what's not allowed from the internal psychological parent yeah so this isn't a podcast on junctions, but I'll just give you a few. Don't exist, don't be, don't be who you are, be what I want you to be, don't feel, don't... We could, I could list them off. Yeah, yeah. So all those no messages, they would get criticism for if they did feel, for example, or express feelings or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they, 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 so they inhibit driver behavior, like we sort of be perfect, say here yeah where they will get strokes so they don't have to displease the parent yeah the injunctions and drivers go together when we talk about analyzing script behavior yeah and they're a really useful tool and again it, you know it, when we're talking about injunctions it's not that our parents say to us don't exist don't feel don't be you don't be close but their behavior says it to us it's kind of that unwritten message that we get from our parents you know I can remember if I was sad or angry when I was growing up you know my mum would say things like don't be sad so it's it's not that she told me not to feel anything but for me I know there were certain emotions it was acceptable to have and certain emotions that maybe it wasn't so you learn over time how to be in your own family that's right, and Barry, Eric Byrne talked a lot about injunctions being non-verbal yeah. and drivers being verbal. Yeah. So the injunctions, like don't express feelings or don't be close to people, are actually modelled non-verbally. Yeah. That's a really good phrase, that, modelled non-verbally. I like that. So they're yeah. much younger. Yeah. It's a much younger process, those injunctions. So then the child learns what they can do instead, usually verbally. Yes. Actually, oh, you know, you, you must do really well at, at school or make sure you, you know, you per, and we talk about be perfect here. You have to do it perfectly. Otherwise, X, X, X. Yeah. So they learn to, and, and you were talking about your case here, the person, the child decides I'm going to get recognition, I'm going to get stroked, I'm going to get praise if I do things perfectly right. Yeah. So that type of child's parent would be something like, well, I don't know, the kid gets 99% out of 100 for their history exam. And when they come home and, you know, if I just think if my daughter done that, there'll be a lot of praise. But the sort of parent we're talking about here, they come home, and the father or the mother or the internalized parent says, well, that's okay, but whatever, what happened to the other 1%? Yeah. So they have to do it perfectly to get the, you know, optimum praise from the parent. Yeah. Which, as children, is all we want from our parents is lots of praise and recognition and validation. So it's understandable that we're going to go down that road and do what it is that we think our parents want us to. Yeah, it's defending against the internal criticism from the parent for doing things they don't want them to do, like yeah. 
you know, uh, expressing feelings or whatever it is that the parent yeah. finds hard. Yeah. And then they they make decisions around that because it's linked to script decisions. Like it's okay to be perfect, and it's pretty scary to, you know, um, express feelings or whatever it is. Yeah. Boarding schools are perfect for that, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Only on that whole injunction driver complex we're talking about. Yeah. Definitely. And I think they just all, you know, the, the script behaviour, the driver behaviour, the injunctions, life script, all that. I think they just all link in so well together and make sense of yeah. something that can be a quite a complex matter, really. Yeah, I think it's very, uh, it's very straightforward to explain. I hope we're explaining it well here. Uh, and then, of course, we need to look at the what I call the early script decision the child makes about life, other people in the world, and how they enact that out, not only in the therapy room, but in the real world. Yeah. In a way which isn't helpful to them. Yeah. So, so go on, sorry. So I was going to say, in their early childhood, help them, help them get by to defend against the internal criticism, to defend against perhaps the parental wrath um uh so it was you know a pretty pretty good way of defending and getting by in that family of origin however in life that may work and may not work as they move away from their family of origin yeah and that's usually when they end up in the therapy room yes. and they're realizing those defense systems don't work as well uh, when they're in other relationships or in other families or in other communication processes. And it's usually where um, they, their real self is lost in the driver, in the driver behaviour. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. For, for anybody that's listening to this, if they want to know a little bit more about drivers, I've got a, a, a quiz on my website. Oh, wow. Um, it's just a little oh. one that I threw together because a lot of my clients were asking, well, how do I know which one I am? Um, so you can jump over to jackiejones.co.uk and under I think it's under free resources. There's a quiz in there that you can do and you just answer some questions and then it'll come up and show you potentially what you were at the time of answering that quiz because we do dip in and dip out of all these different drivers. Yeah, especially on what's stress. going on, yeah. Yeah, it's usually linked to stress. I just want to say I smiled. I know you you, you, you just talked about your own perfect, be perfect driver there, and you just said you just slung this quiz together and put it onto the website. I, I bet it was perfectly done. So I, I... <laughs> Whether it's perfectly done, but it took me a long time to do it. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm yeah. saying, yeah. <laughs> so how do we work with a perfect client in the therapy room, Bob? Would we model imperfections to them? Well, if you think the, the cure, in inverted commas, or the treatment, usually is about finding the hidden self underneath the driver behavior yeah okay yeah so this isn't about this is not about in any shape or form um helping the person dismantle that driver driver behavior for example or you know getting them to uh decrease that driver behavior the first step is to look at what i would call the injunctions underneath the driver behavior that inhibits the real self coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So the work is about helping the person find their real self under the driver behavior. Yeah. Now, now that's easier said than done. Um, so you're going to be working with the child eager state, and by definition, the parent will pop out because the internalized parent, 10 to 1, will not like the person. Um, you know, uh, not not being perfect anymore or yeah. having, you know, accessing their own spontaneity or expressing feelings or whatever it is, because um, that's not what they, uh, they're scripted to do. So you will be facing the internalized parent. So quite often 
uh, this is later in treatment, once you've actually got the relationship with the client and understand the problem, you will do action, what I call action, actionistic techniques where, we, where you will ask the client to role play dialogue with that internalized parent, which wanted them to follow that driver behavior so intensely. Yeah. Because then in the end, the client will need to take ownership back of their real self rather than adapting. Yeah. And that's a slow process. It's not going to happen in one session. No, 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 no. We will talk about because first of all, you've got to get to know the client, you've got to get to know the problem, you've got to understand the driver behavior, you've got to look at the defenses, you've got to understand the injunctions underneath all that before um, you can give permissions for the client to be different. Now, once you start giving permissions for the client to be different, the 10 to 1 that is when the internalized parent will come out. Yeah. And things will happen like the client will come back and say, you know, since I since you gave me permissions to express feelings or I gave myself permission to express feelings, I felt worse. Yeah. And then if you explore a bit more, tell me what you mean by feel worse. Well, you know, I've got a headache. Oh, where have you got a headache? Well, I've got on the le whole of the left side since I started giving myself permission to be. Uh, OK. And and. As we reflect on that, uh, were you hearing any cognition at the same time? Yes, I started to tell myself off for doing this and it doesn't work and I'm no good. And actually, and then we start to discover, and we, we might discover, discover that the parent back in history used to maybe hit the child on the left-hand side when they weren't being perfect. So in other words, the, the, pa the parent pops out and yeah. even the thematic considerations pops out. So you will have to take on the parent. Yeah. So, the, 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 the bit here is the child isn't alone. They have the therapist to, to now um, stand up for them, protect them and help them take ownership of what they weren't able to take ownership of before. Yeah. Which links in really nicely, you know, to something I think we've spoke about in the past as a therapist to offer protection, permission and potency. Mm. That's the time where we need to be more potent than the, the internal parent. Oh, absolutely. Because the internal parent is not going to like. The... Change, any change. Any change. Any change. <laughs> so any change. That's absolutely right. <laughs> also, you know, if they have told them not to do something like be themselves, be, be what I want you to be, they're not going to suddenly like the um, the child starting to take ownership of a different way of being. Yeah. I think this is why I love the, the driver behaviours and the injunctions and everything, because it, it quite seamlessly gets down to the nitty gritty stuff of life and where it comes from and how it is. And our drivers, you know, we like I said, we go when we're stressed or overwhelmed or tired or ill or anything, but it's a defense mechanism. It's it's for our protection. Mm. So we're gonna guard it mm. with as if our very life depends on it. Mm. Absolutely, because maybe it did all those years ago. Yeah. And it, you know, one when you said, you know, a client might come back and say that they feel worse. This might sound awful to some of the listeners, but for me, when a client does that, I think it's quite positive because they've gone down a level. When, we, when we're starting to change things or when things are starting to change, I always warn my clients that you might feel more anxious, you might feel you know, more tired or overwhelmed, but that's a good thing because it proves that you're starting to make some changes. <coughs> I couldn't agree more. And of course, um, that's when often you will go to another layer and perhaps role model, it's role modeling again. Sorry, so role playing again, when you actually, you know, dialogue with the psychological parent. Yeah. Which is really powerful. You know, I've I've witnessed that in a, a goldfish ball type thing when we were doing training, and it's yeah. really powerful. It is. And uh, on another area, of course, I'd like to get it in this podcast, you kindly sent to me, which I'm sorry, I, I briefly looked at it on, on the phone, but uh, for a couple of pages from TA today where 
which you just talked about in terms of, or you showed up to the people who are watching um, uh, TA Today and Pertinent Adaptations, quite a lot of these drivers are particularly pertinent to certain personality styles. Yeah. Or adaptations. Yeah. So we talked about uh, the Be Perfect driver being particularly prevalent with obsessive compulsive personalities, for example. Yeah. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Because yeah. the person who's got obsessive compulsive personality has a high internalized judging parent. Yeah. And therefore, and usually the parent is obsessive themselves, by the way, and then they want the their, their, their child to be perfect. So it's really important and you'll see it you'll see it in the obsessive compulsive personality that by definition will inhibit or exhibit be perfect behavior yeah. you need to get underneath the obsessive behavior patterns which are which is the defense system and the person's way of being to survive uh, to deal with the therapy which is usually to find the person underneath all that yeah and th there will be a lot of traps and games and all sorts of things getting down to that underneath part. Yeah, because you know, the, even though the person comes in with the problem, and often, let's take this through, they, they obsess a lot, uh, they check a lot, or yeah. they do behaviours which means they lack spontaneity. Uh, it's energy dra draining and under stress, it means that they might uh, inhibit intimacy. So they come to therapy and they know they want to be different, but actually as they start to perhaps take the courage to change these behaviors or to start experimenting with being themselves rather than obsessively checking or whatever it is, um, they will feel of often often worse as you said and it's really important that the therapist stays with them at that time yeah and does afford the and does give the protection yeah so so i think it is important or to look at how certain character styles will have certain um drivers under stress and then you'll know what you're working with in a way yeah and there are kind of, I've, I've got my book open on the page as you were speaking, and there are certain things that somebody, when they're in the Be Perfect Driver, body language and things that they might do in front of you. Yeah, so you can spot when, yeah. they're in, when they have moved into this uh, obsessive place by the behavioural um, exhibition of them so do you want to read some of them out that you've got there well, one of the things that stood out for me because i do tend to do this an awful lot is i'll count things on my fingers when i'm talking do you know what i mean so with the kids if i'm having a go at them or if i'm saying there's something it's like well you need to do this and this and this and i literally count it out on my hand and yeah. when i read that in the book i was like oh my god i do that <laughs> so it's 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 interesting some of the actual behaviors that we have that are connected to this that i didn't even realize was a thing until i started training in transactional analysis yeah and in the training you'd be taught to look for those behaviors yeah uh, which indicate a shift in ego states for example uh but that checking off that you talked about is very common uh, to be perfect and again it's pleasing the parent yeah yeah and it, i think that is very parental anyway mm. when i do it Oh, oh. you know the, the ticking things off or the counting or whatever whether that's because it was probably done to me at some point in the past by a parent figure or mm -hmm. or not I don't know but it you know if you think about somebody that is trying their best to, to be perfect they're, they're usually upright standing and sitting you know they sit with their legs in a certain position properly on yeah. the chair and literally everything about them will try to project perfection outwardly yeah, yeah. absolutely and it's in in real life it's very draining yeah and 
as I said, when you're a child, maybe you have to follow these driver behaviors for survival reasons. They often don't help at all when they're in the real world away from the childhood uh, or, or the parents and they they inhibit intimacy, for example. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it, 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 they inhibit the spontaneity. Yeah. They, they inhibit a person expressing feelings in many ways because they're always obsessing if they're doing it the right way. Yeah. For example. Um, so these are the therapy things that people will come with uh, when they're feeling that they have to be perfect all the time. And the other thing, of course, high anxiety often comes with the be perfect driver because you can't be perfect. No. You're always setting yourself up to fail if you attempt to be perfect. Now, I, I know it's a way that pe the, the, the kids survive to get on to please the parent, but in the real world, it's impossible. It is. So with it comes high anxiety because they're always attempting to be perfect and never can be. Which is a bit of a bugger, Bob. <laughs> yeah, it brings high anxiety. It does, it does, yeah. And you can see that in the clients. You know, the, for me, the be perfect client that I would see in the therapy room, as well as the body language and how they're sitting, would be constantly checking in whether everything's okay, whether they got it right. Is there anything I need to do? You know, some clients will even ask for homework in between sessions so that they can prove that they're paying attention and getting it right and doing everything they should do mm. it's it's all those extra little things that they put on themselves that cause that stress and anxiety that's absolutely and you need to give these clients permissions to be themselves yeah and at the same time the problem is by doing that you may actually cause more anxiety yeah so you, you have to eventually take on the parent and you have, I would, and you, know, you don't stop giving permission, but you may explore what happens when you give the permission. Yeah. Oh, the client said, oh, you're just saying that really. Or you're just trying to trick me or you don't really believe that. Or, or even when I do try to follow those permissions, I don't feel well afterwards. So, you know, you know all I hear is a critical parent. So it's all very difficult. So it's all right for you to say, give myself permissions but it's a very uncomfortable process so yeah. these are the sort of conversations which will happen when you're when you're on the road to uh help the client feel more spontaneous or be themselves or uh be feeling okay in relationships these are the sort of processes that will occur it's amazing it's just another another part of transactional analysis that i absolutely love well, I think it's it's a useful piece of theory because you'll see it all the time that people follow the driver behavior so they can survive as a child and and don't you know cause difficulty from their parents and also to defend against you know uh, getting in touch with the negative processes that comes if the if the therapist is sorry if the parent is a vote. Yeah. The problem, as I said, comes before uh, if they start enacting that out in the real life, which they will do. Yeah, inevitably they will do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. of course, if you did go on TA training, you're taught to look for the signs that go with a be perfect driver so that you can spot when they're in that place and, or that ego state. Yeah. And of course, that's what you started to read out in the book. And I think one of the biggest clues is what you've just said is the client looks or looks as if they're perfect. Yeah. So there's no flexibility in their face muscles. They're very rigid in the way they sit. Um, they are just attempting to do everything right. And another way of uh, knowing this, but this is through inquiry about cognition, is they're very black and white thinking. Yes. They have to be perfect. So it's right or it's wrong. Yeah, the middle ground is a very uncomfortable place yeah, to be yeah. with somebody in a be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very uncomfortable. Yeah. But they have to be right or they have to be wrong. Yeah. And uh, and the other thing about the counter transference in this, I well, 
the process of this, of course, is that they will project onto you all the time that they have to be perfect. Otherwise, they're going to suffer punishment. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things, obviously, you know, quite far down the line of working with the client, it's not something that I would do in the early days, but is to model imperfections to them. Give me an example of that. Um, if you can. I, I'm, I'm very dubious about doing this because it's not something that I would recommend for all people to do, but to just get it wrong in the session and notice yourself getting it wrong in the session, whether it's a word that I trip up on or whether I contradict myself in something, but actually modeling the fact that it's okay to get it wrong in the therapy room. Oh, I see. But I, not, I, think, I think it needs to be followed up, Jackie. But I, that's why I wondered what you did clinically. So, uh, so I think this is what you're saying. So I'm dyslexic. So I often say things the wrong way around, like, you know, park arcs instead of car parks or whatever. Yeah. It is. So here's an example. So, you know, maybe, maybe I will choose to do this clinically in the way that you're talking about. So I mix my words up, for example, and then, you know, the client smiles at that. And I say something, how, how is that? Because it's, I know it's really important for you that maybe I'm perfect for you. Yeah. So I think this needs to be linked in with phenomenological inquiry. Yes. To find out what's happening in the client's world. Yeah. When they experience that they're just not being the perfect person for them. Yeah. Or you, my sense of humor often plays out, you know, putting odd socks on. <laughs> yes, that sort of stuff. Things like that. You know, I'm not talking being critical of the client in any way but letting them see me not being perfect 100 yeah. percent of the time yeah yeah and I being remember, okay with it no i remember clinical this is a clinical example which i did so um so i was working with the obsessive somebody and it's quite a big disorder really we'll say traits high maybe heading towards disorder where i have you know, I knew that I had to be perfect from all the things we're talking about here. And he had to be perfect for himself, so he had to escape the wrath of the parent and all those sorts of things. So after, after a while, and you're right, timing is key. So you need to have a relationship, you need to lot this work to be able to actually go to a place where I'm going to say now. So in my room back then, I had big, long settees. So you've been in my training room. And I used to work at the end of my career in the big training room at the Institute and they, <laughs> the, the, the room was full of settees. So anyway, so he would sit on one settee, I'd sit on the other settee. And this is conscious thought, what I'm gonna to say to you now. And uh, I decided one day, well, I'm gonna do exactly what you just said. I'm gonna, and I quite like this because my, I haven't got much of a drive in being perfect, by the way, I've got other drivers, but I quite like, what well, I quite like what I did. So I decided I'm going to lie down on the settee and do therapy with me lying down. And that freaked him out. <laughs> and anyway, so yeah, exactly. So he started, what are you lying down for? You should be sitting up. You're always sitting up. You know, therapy should sit up, or at least you're always sitting up. And I, then I think I said, and this is what I mean by about inquiring. You say, oh, so it's really important that I get it right for you. And is that how it was with your dad, with you? Yeah. So you, may, you need to do make it to make a connection. Yeah. I think you have to make a connection as well. Definitely. I love that, Bob. I can see you doing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and as, as he started to realise all this, I said, is it okay if I continue for the next five or ten sessions doing therapy this way? <laughs> Which we did. And at the end, he was lying down on the city as well. Love it. Both of us. <laughs> Love it. So wild in therapy where we're both lying down. That that's exactly what I mean when I say challenging certain behaviours, but yeah. you've got to have the relationship with the, the client oh, in the yeah. first place. Yeah. Stand, stand away. You wouldn't do that in the first session. Yeah. yeah. I'd worked with him for about a year anyway by then. But um But I love that because therapy doesn't need to be hard work a lot of the time. We can make wonderful connections and have a sense of humor and see the brighter side of life in the therapy room as well. 
No, that's how it should be. Yeah. So that's an example of working with the being perfect. And I think it is important to spot these drivers because then we know that they're where they are at, what's happening, and to follow it up by to what I call inquiry about what's happening internally and then help them make the connections uh, to was this how it was with your parent? Yeah. And what decision did you make from that to survive in the world? And is it helping you now? Yeah. And usually it isn't. It's, uh, no, nine times out of ten. Those, ten times out of ten. The next book after that, I don't know how much you time this podcast, as it's actually, is how you help them integrate new integrate new behaviours in their life. Because you're quite right. It's a gradient. They'll start to feel uncomfortable when they start doing it because they start to activate this parent. Now, as you do the work with the actual parent, that will decrease, and hopefully the, the client or the child will start to take center stage and integrate these new behaviors in their relationships or life so that they can really take ownership of their true self which you know i think that's really good because we're going to be talking about driver behaviors for the next you know three or four sessions of podcasts or whatever so we can touch more on that in the next one okay. so i really enjoyed this one bob so what we're going to be doing on the next one is uh, try hard yeah and i hope for the listener's sake uh, to know that uh, this podcast won't have been perfect, but hey ho, uh, it's enough. I hope. Hundred percent, I'm with you. I'm sure our podcasts are never perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Until the next time, okay. speak soon. Yeah, until next time, bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Therapy Show behind closed doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.